What notorious villain of the 1920s lived in this bungalow in a small town of Stevensville, Michigan? How did the murder of a St. Joe, Michigan police officer at this intersection start a massive nationwide manhunt and bring down the most dangerous man alive, according to Time Magazine of the time? What notorious gangster rented the entire eighth floor of the Hotel Vincent in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and made it his headquarters when he was in town? It's January 1920. Prohibition is now law, and it's illegal to make, import, sell, or consume alcohol in the United States. Bootleg liquor becomes the rage of the day, and the American thirst for spirits only gets stronger. Here, in Chicago, Illinois, gangsters found a new way to make big money, resulting in the infamous gang wars of the time. Hi, I'm Richard. The story I'm about to tell is absolutely true. Now, I've left out quite a few little details for the brevity of this video. But if you check the description below, I'll leave plenty of information where you can find the rest of the story. This is Dean O'Banion, small time crook turned gangster, head of the Irish Northside Gang with Jaime Weiss, Vincent DeRucci, and George Bugs Moran. Now, even though there were truces between the different gangs, Mr. O'Banion had quite a disagreement with the Chicago outfit headed by Johnny Torrio and Al Scarface Capone. This disagreement was settled in the usual way, when O'Banion was sent to his new home. Murdered in his flower shop headquarters, November 10th, 1924, by the Chicago Outfit. This is O'Banion's new home. This started a five-year war between the two rival gangs. Enter Jaime Weiss, now head of the Northside Gang, and at one time known as the only man Capone feared. Bent on revenge for his buddy O'Banion, he and his partners attempted a hit on Torrio. It failed when Moran's gun misfired. The Chicago outfit retaliated with a hit on Weiss. They did not fail. In October 11th, 1926, Jaime Weiss joined his pal O'Banion, just a hundred yards or so away. Vincent, the schemer de Rucci, now took over Weiss's spot, but was killed under suspicious circumstances by police. April 4th, 1927, opening the doors for George Bugs Moran to be the new boss of the Northside Gang, while Johnny Torrio gave up the business for a short while after being wounded in an attack and a stint in the slammer. Al Capone was now the top dog of the Chicago outfit. Now the gang wars continued, culminating into what is now known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, February 14th, 1929. Rumor had it that it was set up by Capone to eliminate Moran. 
They lured Moran's men into a warehouse under the guise of a stolen shipment of booze from Detroit. This theory made sense since US-12 was opened up in 1927 and was a direct route from Detroit to Capone in Chicago. It passes less than a hundred yards from where I now live. However, I believe this theory has been debunked because apparently Moran himself set up the meeting after an attempt on his life in January. Four unknown men, two dressed as cop, lined up the seven men. Moran wasn't there as he slept in and opened fire with two submachine guns and two shotguns. Witnesses noted one of the men was missing a tooth. This massacre was even too much for the generally tolerant Chicagoans. A forensic scientist, Dr. Calvin Goddard, was hired to do ballistics tests, which was new technology at the time, to examine and catalog the evidence. Now Goddard's forensics will play an important part a little bit later in this story. A new couple in town, rich oil man, Frederick Dane, and his wife moved into a bungalow just north of Stevensville, Michigan, September 1929. Dane, new to the area, set out to get to know folks spending large amounts of money to refurbish the bungalow buying furniture at Truce Brothers and St. Joseph, hiring landscapers and painters, all the time making friends in the community. He was known to comfort neighbors when they were ill. He enjoyed reading local newspapers and magazines. Now, he befriended a cigar shop owner who willingly supplied Dane with his favorite cigars. Now, he did seem to have some peculiarities about him. Some thought him he might be a bootlegger, which wasn't unusual in the area, as you will discover a little bit later. But folks thought Fred, missing a tooth, a nice guy, and welcomed him and his wife to the community. It's December 14th. 1929, and Forrest Look and his family are just returning home to Buchanan, Michigan from a shopping trip in downtown St. Joe when a fancy Hudson vehicle veered out of control, hitting the Look Chevy near the intersection of US-12 and Cleveland Avenue. Now the two drivers met and Cool wanted some compensation for the damage, some $25. Getting no satisfaction of compensation for the damage, Cool returned to St. Joe to find the police and describe what had just happened. The Hudson driver also continued into St. Joseph. At about 8 o'clock, Forrest Cool and his family found 25-year-old officer Charles Skelly stationed at the corner of State Street and Broad Street in downtown St. Joseph. As Cool was relating his story to Officer Skelly, the Hudson vehicle passed by, being recognized by family members as the one that hit their car. Now Skelly jumped onto Cool's running board and ordered Mr. Cool to follow after the Hudson. Catching up to the Hudson, Skelly blowing his whistle flagged down the driver who did stop. Skelly boarded the Hudson running board and ordered the driver to drive to the police station a few blocks away where he would settle things there. Again, this time riding on the Hudson running board the car turned right onto Ship Street, then turned right onto Main Street for the two block or so drive to City Hall Police Station, stopping at the corner of Main and Broad Street for a traffic light. When the light turned green, the Hudson hesitated. 
The driver, apparently in a panic, pulled out a Colt 45 and shot Skelly three times. The driver sped off, heading south as Skelly, alive but critically wounded, clung to life, being helped by bystanders. Now the driver of the Hudson lost control of his vehicle down on Lakeshore Boulevard. Escaping on foot and carjacking two cars, he made his way south out of St. Joe. As he was making his escape, police found the Hudson, and paperwork in the Hudson led to the one and only Frederick Dane, and they knew where he lived. The driver of the Hudson eventually made it to the bungalow, and here's where the story really starts to get interesting. Dane, already seeing that police were at the bungalow, being dirty and disheveled, convinced an unsuspecting neighbor to drive him to Coloma, Michigan, and from there he made his escape. Meanwhile, back at the St. Joe Sanitarium, Officer Charles Skelly, in critical condition, yelled out his final words, Get that guy! He closed his eyes and died. It was 11.50 p.m. Who was Frederick Dane, and why would he kill Officer Skelly? The answer turned up in a search at Dane's bungalow in Stevensville, Michigan. Officers found ammunition, three bulletproof vests, revolvers, sawed-off shotguns, hand grenades, tear gas bombs, disguises, $390,000 worth of stolen bonds, and in a false floor in a locked closet, two Thompson submachine guns. Okay, so this is my favorite space in the house. Um, below this space there is um, a room that is about three feet lower than the rest of the house. And so there's about like three or four feet between the flooring here and the ceiling downstairs. And that over there is where they found Escher, come, all of the guns. Well, they found most of them up here. As the investigation progressed, a fingerprint from a salt shaker of all things led to the true name of Fred Dane, none other than Frederick Killer Burke, a prime suspect of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Later, ballistics testing of the two Thompson submachine guns tested by Goddard's laboratory in Chicago proved one of the Thompsons was used at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Burke was now subject of a nationwide manhunt and deemed in a Time Magazine article December 30th, 1929 as the most dangerous man alive. Now it really made sense for Burke to hide out and settle in this local area. Southwest Michigan had become a well-known vacation area for prominent Chicago dignitaries. Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak kept a home in Union Pier until his assassination in 1933 in Miami, Florida. Attorney John F. Terrell, prosecutor for the Black Sox baseball scandal of 1919, had a home in nearby Long Beach, Indiana. The beaches, golf courses, and quiet living 
was also a place for gangsters to come and relax away from the hustle and bustle of the city. The farmers in the area found it more lucrative to sell their grain to the bootleggers rather than the cash per bushel they got at the market. When US-12 was completed, travel from Chicago to this quiet vacation land took less than two hours. It became a direct route from Detroit to Chicago, a passageway for illegal alcohol to find its way to the Windy City. Now the most prominent Chicago citizen to visit the area was Al Scarface Capone, better known by his pals as Snarky, a short form of sharp dresser. He was a frequent visitor to the lakeside in Lakeside, Michigan. Rumor has it in Sawyer, Michigan that Capone came to the Flynn Theater to take in some shows. He stayed in St. Joe at the Whitcomb Hotel on many occasions. In fact, Capone and his fellow gangsters liked it so much, he convinced fellow gangster pals to build the Hotel Vincent in Benton Harbor, Michigan. There he rented the entire eighth floor, changed it to his liking, and it became his headquarters any time he visited the area. It was pretty much common that he would drop the elevator operator and the front desk clerk hundred dollar bills to ensure that no one made it any further than the seventh floor. Now. Al Capone never owned property here, but his henchmen certainly did. Louis Little New York Campagna owned this farm on the St. Joseph River in Berrien Springs, Michigan. It was later the home of world heavyweight boxing champion Muhammad Ali. Philip D'Andrea, Capone's bodyguard, built this house in St. Joseph, Michigan along the St. Joseph River. A great hideout and possible escape route via the river. Some other notable gangsters in the area were Jake Guzik, nicknamed Greasy Thumb, greased the palms of people to keep them clear of his boss, Capone. Paul the Waiter Rica, who Capone took a liking to once warned Capone of a potential hit and took a bullet in the shoulder in doing so. And Edward Convalenka, another pal of Capone. As Officer Skelly lay dying in the St. Joe Sanitarium, Burke made his escape from Coloma. Heading west to Green City, Missouri, where he eventually changed his name to Richard F. White, remarried, and lived at his father-in-law's farmhouse. A Joseph Hunsaker considered himself an amateur detective and was an avid reader of True Detective magazine. An October 30 issue had an article about Egan's Rats Gang of St. Louis fame and it had a picture of Killer Burke. Hunsinger noticed a resemblance to Mr. White and started his own investigation, eventually including Mr. Alan D. Morrison. As it became evident that White was in fact Killer Burke, an early morning raid by the St. Joe, Missouri Police Department at the farmhouse where Burke was staying caught Mr. Burke unawares, and he was captured March 26th, 1931. Extradited to St. Joseph, Michigan, where he pled guilty to the murder of Skelly and was sentenced to life in prison in Marquette, Michigan. Burke died on July 10th, 1940 at age 47 and is buried in Park Cemetery, Marquette, Michigan, under his birth name, Thomas A. 
camp. And for George Bugs Moran, the target of the St. Valentine's Day massacre, well, he was arrested for an Ohio bank robbery, convicted and sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. He died of lung cancer a few months into his sentence on February 25, 1957, at the age of 63. Al Scarface Capone was arrested on 22 counts of tax evasion and convicted of five. He was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison, but released early due to his mentally ill health. He died January 25, 1947, at the age of 48. He is buried here, not far from his Northside gang enemies, O'Banion and Weiss. This is the family plot of Officer Charles Skelly. Father, Mother, Infant Daughter, But what we're interested in is behind this marker, the final resting place of Officer Charles Skelly, buried December 17, 1919, under his birth name. Now he took on the name Skelly when he became a police officer, as it was more Americanized and easier to pronounce. I took this video exactly 92 years almost to the hour of his burial.